So welcome um, to this group's discussion titled Knowledge Production, Media and Access in African Studies. My name is Stephanie Kitchen and I'm the Publications Officer of the International African Institute based here at SOAS. Uh, nowadays mainly concerned with the publication of long-term research on Africa in humanities and social sciences fields and with the wider dissemination of such knowledge. Notably, we published the ethnographic journal Africa, coming up to 90 years of publication, and the high-profile contemporary book series on topical issues, African arguments. I'm very pleased the conveners of this conference agreed to a slot to discuss publishing and dissemination, or knowledge production and access in relation to Africa and knowledge produced in and about the continent. Our kind of collective shared contention is that these issues are of central concern to researchers, writers, editors, publishers, cultural producers, media and information specialists, wherever we work. And just picking up a few things that struck me today, Rebecca Roak Bukosa from Uganda this morning was talking about these, these issues um, already. And Anya Kachi this afternoon spoke about the need to increase knowledge production. And of course, we all know that the central theme running through the conference language is, is very central to the discussion. I'm very soon going to hand over to the four speakers who have been asked to address various aspects of this discussion today. And in respecting the spirit of this event, all the speakers are going to be fairly brief and as untechnical as possible whilst addressing you, our large and diverse audience. We then hope we'll have time for a lively debate. Please keep your comments and questions until after we've heard all, all four speakers. I'm going to introduce all the speakers together. Um, and to do so, I'm first of all very delighted to welcome Nanjala Nayabola, who agreed to take part in this event as a writer and researcher with a legal background from Kenya, with particular interests in politics and social media, marginalized voices, refugee policies, and gender. Second, I'm equally delighted that Khadija George, a writer, literary editor, activist, and publisher associated, at least for me, with Sable, Lit Mag, and People Tree Press, and many, many other things, agreed to join this panel to discuss her research and activities in black and African publishing in the UK, East, and West Africa. Then we will have Janet Remington, an editorial director from Routledge, which publishes some 90 academic journals related to Africa, most of which originate from the continent. Janet is also involved in research, recently publishing a collection of scholarly essays to mark the centenary of Sol Plaike's native life in South Africa. And last but not least, my colleague Helen Porter runs the SOAS Institutional Repository called SOAS Research Online, a publicly, avail publicly accessible website and database containing PhD theses journal articles, books, and chapters produced by students and staff within the school. I'll leave her to tell us more, more about that and how many items are contained within the repository. I might, might have mentioned that. She also advises SOAS staff and students on open access, the publishing process, and is working on, the, on development of support for research data management in the school. Um, so I'll sit down now and ask Nanjala to come and, come and talk to you. Good afternoon, everyone. OK. Um, in my country, we have this question that we, I'm from Kenya. We ask people when they're in this state of mind, the post-lunch. Uh, and I, it's very easy to go pamoja, which means, are we together? And you say, yes. yes. Or you can say, eh. Yes. <laughs> to go pamoja. Yes. Sawa, to end I do have a PowerPoint, but I'm not going to share it with you because I like secrets. Um, and <laughs> no, the reason I'm not going to share it with you is because I find often if I put the PowerPoint up, then you're reading the PowerPoint and you're not listening to what I'm saying. And I, I'd like for you to listen to what I'm saying. I think it's good, but I'm obviously biased. So take that as you will. Um, as Stephanie said, my name is Nanjala Nyabola. I'm an independent researcher. I wear very many hats. It confuses people, not least of whom myself. Um, and the, the reason I was asked to give this presentation is because I've been working for the last year and a half now on a research project about how social media and digital spaces are shaping Kenyan politics. And um, 
I think in the West, everybody's kind of consumed right now with a fake news discussion. And I find it so, I find it a little bit disingenuous because I'm like, well, fake news isn't new. You know, the reason why we have libel laws and slander laws is because we have a tradition of using information to disparage political and social op opponents. The thing that's new, the thing that's different is the internet, which is changing the speed at which information is generated and disseminated around the world. So I've been in Kenya for the last, on and off, for the last um, two and a half years now, but I know every detail about the Trump election. I know every detail that's in public, at least, about Brexit and about all of these things. And I'm not even following these things with like a, a level of in-depth analysis. It's just the speed at which news is traveling has changed. Africa is not immune to these things. This is happening in um, many countries, and Kenya is actually an excellent example of this because we have a significant presence on online spaces, and it's changing the way we interact with power and the way we interact with authority. So a lot of what I'm saying is coming from that research, which is really investigating the reasons why. 10 years ago, I could go to the office of the deputy public prosecutor and say, someone has stolen my car and he could ignore my filing for 10 years. But today I can tweet at him, say, Duncan, someone stole my car and he has to respond. And he's been compelled to respond. That's the origin of this research and that's kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm going to be guiding this direction, this conversation, sorry. Um, three questions that I'm going to be looking to answer. Who is, Kenyan, who is Kenya's media? And what function does the media serve in Kenya that's, I would say, uniquely Kenyan or very specific to the Kenyan condition? And finally, how is new media changing the traditional media and the way knowledge is produced and consumed in the space that we would call media? So who is Kenyan media? Um, the most popular form of media in Kenya by and large, by the, every metric, is radio. 78% of Kenyan households have radio. And in the, in, in the modern world, uh, even in Nairobi, we have this, um, I don't have a radio anymore. I haven't had a radio for a while. I used to listen to radio every morning. I don't have one anymore. And so there's this sense that it's a dated technology because we all have our smartphones and whatever. But Every time I leave Nairobi, every time I go into a, a, a rural area, and not even that far, I always find this pattern repeating itself. People sitting around a public space, sharing a single radio and discussing the news. So by and large, radio is the, still the most popular form of media in Kenya. The largest uh, station is the formerly owned state broadcaster, the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, which has 100% nationwide reach. You can get it anywhere. Um, but here's an interesting thing that's happened in the last 10 years. They are now, in 1992, there were two radio stations in Kenya. The English service, the Swahili service, and then you had the international stations, the BBC World Service, the VOAs, and what have you. In 2017, there are 158 radio stations in Kenya. 54 are broadcasting in languages other than English and Swahili and 19 languages, in 19 languages out of Kenya's, out of a possible 44. Um, the Royal Media Group is a private corporation. It's not a listed corporation, but it is a private corporation, and it owns the broadest variety of local language stations. Now, what does that suggest? The person who is able to shape and influence the Royal Media Group is able to shape and influence information consumed by people in up to 11 different languages. And this was a huge issue in the uh, 2007 election, after the 2007 election, we had the post-election violence. A lot of people were, the, the challenge with local radio stations is that I, as a Luya speaker, as a Banyala speaker, don't know what the Kikuyu radio station is broadcasting. Right? And so it's difficult for people to monitor content across all of these local languages. But there is the advantage that more people are able to consume information that's generated on these platforms. So the debate about whether local media, local language radio stations are good and bad is still very much up for, up for discussion in Kenya. The second piece of the pie is television. Again, the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation is the only nationwide station in the country. Um, but the most watched television station is Citizen Television, which is also owned by the Royal Media Group. 
you can see, I kind of, kind of hope you can kind of see a little pattern developing here. Um, only about, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Only about 28% of Kenyan households have um, television. But a survey by the BBC that actually came out this week found that television is the most trusted source of information, of political information in Kenya. And those of us who are Kenyan kind of know this instinctively. I'll tell you why. I was in, I was away for most of the 2007, the build up to the 2007 election. I only went home for the actual election. And I was consuming online the, what the print media was producing online. And I thought I kind of, I knew everything that was happening. But there's something about video and something about the ability to capture a person at a podium giving a speech that having to transcribe and then produce the newspaper article after that kind of loses. And it also has, it has a lot to do with the fact that we are an oral culture. People say things, politicians say things at speeches that they would not be able to, it's difficult to capture in the written word. We switch languages very easily. That's how, that's how Kenyans speak. We switch between two, three, maybe even more languages. And that orality makes television a more powerful medium of capturing a political moment than print media. Um, with the digital migration, right now there's no, terrestre, there's no um, analog television in Kenya. The space for television has opened up dramatically. In the beginning, we had KBC. 1991, we had our first private television station, KTN. Then came NTV, Citizen, blah, blah. And right now, if you have a set-top box, at the bare minimum, you can get about 20 television stations. Some are music, entertainment, MTV-style stations. Some are news. Some are um, politics. Some are just telenovelas. Literally, just telenovelas. I love them. That's how I learn Spanish. Um, and the last piece of the puzzle, as I've implied, is print. Uh, Kenyan print media is dominated by two brands, The Nation and The Standard. Um, both of them are publicly listed corporations. That does not mean that both of these are publicly owned corporations. The largest shareholder in The Nation media group is the Aga Khan, the Aga Khan Foundation. And the largest shareholder in The Standard is Question Mark. Um, there's a lot of speculation uh, that it is the current sitting president's family the, and, and a, a combination of the current sitting president and the former sitting president's family. Why does this matter? There are over 7 million newspapers that are sold in Kenya every day. People read newspapers. People get a lot of information, rely on them for a lot of political information. The biggest advertiser in the newspapers is the state is the government. And so in recent years, we've seen a worrying trend whereby it's called fisking, whereby the state threatens to withdraw advertising from the newspapers in order to control the content that the newspapers are able to produce. The challenge in Kenya is that the state is not subtle about this. There is no subtlety about how they're doing this. So earlier this year, we had the scandal with an, uh, a, a managing editor for the Saturday Nation called Dennis Galava. And Dennis wrote an editorial, which if you read it in the UK today, you'll think, this is the most harmless, lukewarm thing I've ever seen. But in Kenya, it was a big deal because Dennis wrote an article in which he directly criticized the sitting president for political inaction and allowing co corruption to fester. Dennis was fired. And in fact, his version of the story is that he was called to State House for an audience with the uh, Manoa Supisu, the spokesman to the president, and was told that he was going to be fired. The call didn't come from his boss, it came from State House. Right? And so, what this story, it wasn't a secret, everybody in Kenya knows about it. And what does that do? It diminishes public trust in the newspapers. If they're firing people for being critical, <clears throat> what are they keeping from me? If you read Kenyan newspapers, you'll also find that it's full of blind items. A certain so-and-so minister was caught sneaking into nightclub Y at 2 p.m. What does that leave? It leaves a lot of gaps for people to fill in information for themselves. So rumors, <coughs> speculation. I heard, she said, I heard the president has a second wife. If 
you ask anybody, the former president rather, if you ask anybody in Kenya, does Mwai Kibaki have two wives? The answer will be yes. There is no public record of the fact that Mwai Kibaki has two wives, okay? So, Nation Media Group, 40% of the circulation in Kenya, Standard is 20% of the circulation. Having all these facts in mind, Kenya's media has an outsized role in public life because of many gaps in the way in which knowledge is produced and disseminated. And in the 1980s, in the, in the pushback against the attempted coup, Kenya's universities got gutted. A lot of academics had to go into exile and flee because they were, um, their lives were threatened for criticizing the state. The archives became manipulated. You can't access um, information. There's a lot, if you go to the Kenya archives and look up certain sub subjects, all you'll find is redacted documents. There are things that people weren't allowed to report on. And so the media then becomes this, there's a saying that the media is the first draft of history. In many ways in Kenya, the first draft of history is the only draft of history. That events are captured in the press in a particular moment, but they're not given any historical context or any forward analysis in order to protect the journalists. The journalists are protecting themselves from consequences. And so you'll open the newspaper and you'll see something like, there was a famine, there's a famine in Kenya right now and seven million people have died. Okay, that sounds horrible. And, but it's not the first time that there's been a famine in Kenya. It's not just because it's not rained. There is an institutional uh, background to the reason why people don't have food, but the press will never cover that. Right? Because of that, what I talked about before, the practice of being threatened economically and sometimes physically. Two journalists so far this year have been killed for their reporting, according to the, the Committee to Protect Journalists. So um, this first draft of history becoming the final draft of history with an audience that is already primed to mistrust the press, it creates this very weird ecosystem where people recognize that the press is important and they consume the information that's produced by the press, but they also know that the information produced by the press is probably not that reliable. At the same time, there's very little narrative nonfiction that's published in Kenya. If you wanted to read a novel, great. Very few people are writing nonfiction books at the moment. So there's not that longevity that's that like, I'm gonna write a story about Kenya that captures the last 50, 60, 70 years. Most of the most influential books about Kenyan history that are available to you now are probably not written by Kenyans. Um, and so, and then the last piece of the puzzle is, this form of state control over the press has also always been about content. In other countries, um, if someone doesn't want you to read a newspaper, they'll just go and buy every single copy of that newspaper, arrest, this happens a lot in our neighboring countries, there's a camera, I cannot go into details. Um, <laughs> but you'll see people buying up every copy of a specific newspaper, like the Addis Standard had this experience, um, so that people don't read what's there. I think this happens in, in Khartoum a lot as well. In Kenya, what, it, what happened instead, especially under the first Kenyatta and Moy, is that the information became skewed towards this, develop, it's called developmental journalism. Let's work together and build the nation. Let's talk about positive things. Let's build gabions. Does anybody here know what a gabion is? Because every Kenyan does, right? I see you. Because that was the narrative that we were being told, that we had to work together to build the nation. And things of political import become less significant. So if you are the newspaper that's publishing about so-and-so clash, uh, uh, you know, this historical narrative about extrajudicial killing, for example, you're not participating in the nation building project. You're a bad newspaper. And that's a form of censorship too, because it limits the spectrum of information that people are able to access about their country. Um, and tied to this is the um, consequences of the 2007 political crisis. I call it the peace lobotomy, because what happened? In the lead up to the 2007 election, the newspapers were a very contested space. Most uh, publications had taken sides with one major candidate or another. And when the post-election violence happened in Kenya, one of the main things that was, the narratives that was produced was, if the media had been more unified, none of this would have happened. And the Kenyan media seems to have internalized this critique. 
And so, um, and uh, January 4th, I believe, which was four days into the, uh, six days into the political crisis, the headline in every single major newspaper and the Chiron in sort of every TV station was, we want peace. We want peace in Kenya has come to mean we are not going to ask uncomfortable questions. We're not gonna raise uncomfortable issues. Right? And that's why I call it the peace lobotomy, that it, if you are looking for searing political critique in Kenya, you're not necessarily going to find it in the newspapers or on television even. So what does that mean overall? For new media, this is why Kenya is, was primed to be one of the, the countries in which new media becomes this super significant space for having political discourse, for constructing political identities. Blogging became, rose to prominence in Kenya in 2007 precisely because of the low levels of trust in traditional media, uh, coupled with the fact that so many Kenyans did have access to online spaces and a significant number of Kenyans were in the diaspora trying to get information about Kenya and not being able to do so. Traditional media was also self-censoring their websites significantly at this point. And those of us, I was, I myself included, this is actually what triggered my writing career was trying to get information that I wanted to about Kenya in the UK and not being able to do that. Another significant thing that happened was that blogging allowed women to participate in media in a way that traditional media would not allow. The most prominent bloggers in Kenya in 2007 were all women. Uh, Oreo Kolo, Kenyan Pundit, uh, Juliana Rotich, Afromusing. All of the big blogs that people were using to get information about the, the po political crisis were being run by women. And this space existed primarily because the state didn't understand it. What is blogging? I mean, we're talking about a state that is, you know, <laughs> a couple of decades behind the public. And so they didn't understand what was happening, and so they didn't interfere with it. And this community started to, to coalesce around this idea of national identity and saving the country and really pushing back against the self-censorship that was happening in the, in the traditional press. Today, the most popular way, platform for information, for political information in Kenya is probably WhatsApp. WhatsApp is available for free as a default in most smartphones. Um, it's where a lot of hate speech is perpetrated, unfortunately, as well. So slander, remember I talked about how people mistrust things and it leaves room for rumors and gossip. Um, WhatsApp has been key in leaking financial scandals, especially people take photographs of key financial documents and distribute them on WhatsApp. Um, Facebook, 5.2 Kenyan, 5.2 million Kenyans are on Facebook. Um, and it's a semi-open network. People feel safe to be free because they think they're only talking to their friends, but Facebook is not an, a, a closed network, and so hate speech posts tend to leak and tend to get people in a lot of trouble. And there are now two million Kenyans who are on Twitter, um, and this is, the network, this is an open network that's preferred by urban elites especially, and that is shaping, the, this is what I'm talking about, shaping the behavior of institutions. So shame, Twitter has made it possible for Kenyans to shame public institutions into action, and that's made it the most popular platform for having political engagement that is more or less lacking in traditional media. Um, trying to blitz through these last few slides. Um, One minute, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna um, basically say, um, the more traditional media Social media started as kind of a couple of the people who were on the blogging spaces talking to each other publicly. And this kind of spectator sport, the people were watching people like uh, Ori and Juliana interact and then they're, and they say, well, I have something to add to this. And suddenly this community coalesces. If you look up hashtag KOT on Twitter, you'll see that there's a little bit of a community that's forming around political conversation especially. Um, and what happened really was that these, this community became super critical of traditional media. And the diaspora is consuming primarily information coming from the social media networks. The more traditional media ignored trends that were appearing on social media, the more out of touch traditional media appeared. And so suddenly in the last five years, you see traditional media looking to social media for content and allowing therefore 
discourse that's being formed on social media to influence what is being produced in traditional media and therefore what is being consumed by the nation in general. Some of these trends have actually led to social movements that have had a massive impact on public discourse in Kenya. One I like to talk about is the My Dress, My Choice movement, which really is about women reclaiming their right to wear short dresses, tight dresses, um, in the central business district, which had come under threat because of the spate of um, stripping attacks. Pub uh, women were being stripped in public for being seen to be dressed indecently. The hashtag started online. It led to a public protest. Public protest le led to a change in the law. And if you go to Nairobi, walk the streets of Nairobi today, you will see more women, short skirts, sleeveless tops, walking through the central business district than you did three years ago, four years ago, before the movement happened. So the stuff that's happening on social media is not insignificant. It is having a really big impact on politics in Kenya. Um, there are greater le because there are greater le levels of trust in these spaces, it also leaves the opportunity for exploitation. And so fake information, fake news, is actually a significant challenge in Kenya at the moment. Um, to loop back to the theme of this presentation, three points. Um, social media and knowledge production. Social media is supplanting this first draft of history role that traditional media was playing before. People are, um, because what, of what I said about how the traditional media is now getting most of its content from, from social media, the first draft of history of how accounts of, of events in Kenya is being drafted is being drafted, a lot of it is being drafted on social media. Hashtags are functioning as a public archive, allowing for more collectivization of knowledge. If you want to find information about a particular thing that's happening, it's much easier to do that if you go online and look up the hashtag than if you sit down and flip through the newspapers, because as I said, newspapers are still very much subject to censorship from different directions. One of the key things, another key thing is that it's challenging this nationalist narratives about identity and belonging. Women, LGBTI Kenyans, Kenyans of Asian origin, groups that wouldn't ordinarily find themselves represented in traditional media are finding more and more space to identify as Kenyans and to be part of the national discourse. Um, it, you, if you see how people respond to the, um, what's Ezekiel Mutua's job? Um, <laughs> he's in charge of censorship, basically. But if you see the pushback that he gets every time he comes up, he calls it gayism but every time he comes up against LGBTI Kenyans, there's a significant pushback in a way that wasn't able to happen in traditional media, which still refuses to engage with LGBTI Kenyans as full citizens. And finally, there's a fact-finding element that I find really intriguing. Um, whenever a, a rich Kenyan dies, the media always produces this hagiography that they were great. And you know, we, in last week, we had four prominent Kenyans who were implicated in large massacres who died, and the media said they were great men who were interested in education, and it's wonderful. And Kenyans went on social media and said, that is some bleep. Um, because, and they had proof. And they had proof of them being implicated in the Truth and Justice Reconciliation Commission, and saying these men are not the great men that traditional media portrays them at. So pushing back against this editorialization of history has become a really important function that social media is serving. That's my last slide. Um, basically, as I said in the beginning, um, it's just about this shift between what is considered to be knowledge, who gets the right to produce the knowledge, and how is that knowledge consumed? And I think that the changes that we're seeing in the ways in which social media is changing the way media is produced and consumed is going to be a significant influence into how Kenyan politics plays out in the next 10, 20, maybe even 30, 40 years. So thank you for your time. Okay, now we've got Khadija um, to carry straight on. Heels. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, my name's Khadija. I'm a bit like her Nanjala. I have like a, have lots of hats. I have two names. 
Khadija George and I write with Khadija Sasse, but I'm actually one and the same person. I just do the job for two people. Um, so I posed three questions for my presentation, which is about um, models of publishing that African publishers use. I'm not necessarily going to answer these questions directly, but they're for us to think about, since we're thinking about, um, you know, um, pub in this case, publishing in Africa uh, in the future. So what are the models of publishing that African publishers have adopted? Whose work are they producing? Whose work are they producing and publishing? And are they profitable? Are they sustainable? And that last one particularly was of interest to me because in terms of my research that I'm doing at Brighton, it kind of started when I was looking at, I wanted to look at black British publishers and in the creative industry. And when I looked at the, um, the work in the creative industry and who was doing what and who was earning what publishing was actually making the most money and I thought well it must be music publishing obviously and in fact it wasn't so I thought well okay if it's not music publishing where where did the black publishers feature in this and um, where where is the money and, and you know I want to look at our visibility and um, the fact that we need to get a piece of that money pie if it was out there so that, that was kind of my thought, because I'm always very concerned about, about the publishing, black publishing in this country and the publishing of black writers. So it, it's, it's kind of linked. I've kind of moved on from that a little bit and what I'm researching at the moment. But when I talk of African publishers, I am talking of publishers in the diaspora as well. To me, it's all, all one and the same, because we do, a lot of the times, we work together in, in, different, in different ways. So I'm just going to look at a few models um, at the moment. Oops, not very good at this thing. Um, and these are the publishers I'm going to be discussing, I'm going to be discussing today. Um, SLWS, Sierra Leone Mitre Series in Sierra Leone, Sable Publications, Stroke Gelada um, Collective, which is what I run. I'm discussing that in the terms of what's going on, what we're doing in the Gambia. Um, Hansip Publications, which is based in the UK, and AWP, Africa World Press, is based in the US. I'm going to probably talk about those two together because there's some similar things I want to talk about. And, oh, sorry, that should be actually APWPBF, uh, African Publishing Book Fund. But it'll get corrected later. Sorry about that. Um, okay. I'm going to start off with SLWS because this kind of really fascinated me, Sierra Leone Writer Series. And as you can see at the bottom there, it says they're an academic and general publisher for Sierra Leoneans and other nationals whose writings have Sierra Leonean content. And like these are the kind of range of, of books they, they've published. They've only been going for, I think, since about two, 2011. And the reason why I wanted to discuss them is because they've got quite a very interesting setup. Um, and one of the basic ways they, they, they're using to publish it is social media. They have templates of the book layout and format and design on their website. So basically, writers are requested, you, you drop your own, your own content onto those templates. And writers, it's not a vanity publisher. People are not expected to pay to get their books published, but they, are, they do have to commit to purchase a minimum number of the books. It's not, I did put to cover costs, but it's not to cover all the costs. They are committed to get a certain number, which I think is only reasonable. Um, because as well, at the end of the day, it's writers are going to sell their books the most. I mean, and that happens in, in, anyway. Even though writers a lot of times think, well, I've written the book, now it's up to the publisher to market it. It isn't. It's up to the writer to do as much as they can with the marketing, because they're the ones. Really, people, publishers do sell books more when, when the writer is around. Um, with SLWS, cover designs are often showcased on their WhatsApp group for comment and critique. Um, for distribution, they internationally, they sell most easily via Amazon. And they make sure that it is a cheaper cover price in Sierra Leone. So no matter what the book costs, they do make sure that Sierra Leoneans can afford it. Uh, this is what I found very, as well interesting about SLWS. They published two anthologies, one of poetry and one of short stories. And they were produced entirely on WhatsApp. The submissions were sent on WhatsApp. The selections were made via WhatsApp. They were edited, proofed, and designed. Everything was done on WhatsApp. 
and they've got a group called the Sierra Leone Writers Forum. There's about 100 Sierra Leone writers on this from all over the world. Um, and I, I, I joined the group, and it was like, this thing just kept pinging all the way through the night. These people just don't sleep. It's just like ping, ping, ping. They're like, what are you talking about? So um, I haven't really got so much involved in the writing, but a lot of the comments, is quite interesting, are done in Creole. So it's really improved my Creole, because I'm a rubbish Creole speaker, but it's really improved just being on the WhatsApp. So sometimes this critique can be quite harsh, but actually when it's done in Creole, it actually sounds so funny. I don't think people really mind. Um, so, I mean, so SLWS, that is a very interesting format in the sense that um, because it's all kind of done by social media, they've kind of alleviated a lot, a lot of their different costs and putting a lot of the onus on, on the writer to work with them on that. But things are still, it's, they're not just published, um, as, you know, as soon as people put them out there on, on the template, they are all edited. Um, in-house, and they've got a very, very strong editorial board with quite a few of the most well-known Leone academics around the world actually on their editorial board. Uh, stable publications, and we've been doing two things. One of the things, one of my dreams actually was to always move my headquarters to, to Africa, and so we are actually moving to, to the Gambia. And one of the, as part of the Mboka Festival, that we had in the Gambia in January, um, we were able to get Ngugi Wai Chiongo to come. Um, I tempted him and kind of blackmailed him that we were going to publish <laughs> one of his books in Gambian languages, which we did. I'll, I'll do the talk about that in the next slide. So this is the magazine that I published, Sable. So in moving it, I have, you know, kind of, printing is a little bit more expensive, but they can, they, their printing is, is, is of really good quality. So it, it is a bit more expensive, but it'll be cheaper for me in terms of design. So I've, I've kind of kind of weighed up those, those two different things because it is really important for me to say, yes, we are, we are going to be publishing in Africa. And what we did is, um, this is Ngugi's book that um, a lot of people are talking about. I know people know about the Gelada Collective and the, and the project that they're doing with Ngugi, Batyongo, and the translations. Well, we got involved with that, and we were able to publish the Upright Revolution in three Gambian languages, in Wolof, in Mandinka, and in Jola. And, um, you know, I, I met Ngugi last April, and I, and I asked him to come as part of the literary festival, and he just said, how many languages do you have in Gambia? I said, oh, we've got about seven. He said, can we publish this story? And he gave us the rights, well, through Gelada have, have the rights to do this, to say that we were going to print. Not, he hasn't given that permission to a lot of people to print, but we got that to print, as long as we just were just selling it in the, in the Gambia, which is, which is fine with me. And we just did signed copies, and um, we have a very limited edition, and as we do with Sable, and we have signed copies and unsigned copies. Um, but we did do some audio as well to go up on the Chalada Collective site. So it's on their site in Wolof. And if you go to their site, I have put the link at the very end. If you go to their site, the story is now online in about 60 languages, and at least 50 of those are in, in African languages. So if anybody wants to be involved, they can just contact them and, and get the story translated as well for it to go online. But what was important for me as well to have it in print is the fact that I can sell this as a limited edition, um, cover my costs, and the rest of the money we, we goes to a charity, and it actually goes to a school, Roots, Roots um, Preschool, to help, to help with the school. Now, I couldn't do that if it was just online, because I couldn't, like, you know, sell anybody anything online. But with the print one and having Ngugi sign it, I can. So if you do want to buy a copy, I do have some. <laughs> um, and they do have the only really... They don't really have any publishing houses in Gambia at the moment. There is only one publisher, and it is more like a, a what we call here, a vanity press. You see, but all of these terms now are changing because of all technology. These things are changing. Um, and so people, if they do publish, they do have to cover the cost with the publisher. But we're trying different things, and one of the things that Ngugi, um, this kind of exchange blackmail we had, is that I would be printing more African languages in... Um, in Gambia, more books with African languages in Gambia. So what we're actually going to be doing when we do the festival each year is we will publish 
the, the, the guest writer's work, we will be publishing them in, lang in, in, langu in um, Gambian languages. So in January, we have Linton Cressy Johnson coming, and he has a lot of fans in the Gambia. So if we can get, and he's already given us permission to publish some of those in Gambian languages. So if we have a selection of his most popular poems and publish them in Gambian languages, people are going to be so happy. Um, because you know we're, we're giving it to people in, not just in English, but in, 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 in uh, local languages, which I think is very important. I'm going to talk about Hansib Publications, which is based here, um, and AWP together. Let me just go back. Um, Hansib Publications was started in 1970. And um, at the moment, in terms of a black publisher, it's one of the uh, most expansive ones. They have about 16 different categories. <laughs> And they publish such a wide range of books. And I put this one, the cover of this one up, because this one was really important. Black Death in Police Custody and Human Rights, the failure of the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry. You know, something like this wouldn't have come to light with another major publisher. Hansib uh, basically took the risk to do that. And they did get into a lot of problems by doing it. But it was important for our community to do that. And they did it. All the time I'm thinking about this, when I like, for example, I started with SLWS. And I talked about Sable, talking about Hansip. And when I talk about AWP, none of these publishers are funded. They're all independent, small publishers. Um, and um, it's all about us publishing our stories the way they need to be published, but also about publishing the books in high quality as well. Uh, I do have some catalogues of, um, of Hansip. You can have a stand here, but if people want to get just to have a look at some of the information and stuff about Hansi, what they do, and the range of books that, that they do in terms of like the biographies, etc. It's really, it really is very good. Africa World Press are based in New Jersey. And I put distribution in, in commas there because one of the USPs that they had when they were starting up is what they really looked at in terms of the gap in the market was yes, in terms of getting the books published was one thing. Distribution is always an issue as for, for independent publishers. And, distribu and distributors take a huge chunk. Um, one of the things I find, because I work with writers as well as working with publishers, is that writers don't really understand the business that they're working in. So with the writers I work with, when I work with, and as Stephanie mentioned, with People Tree Press, for example, um, and all of the writers are outside of London, to go to something like the London Book Fair, which is in London, which is, I think, the second largest trade fair, book trade fair in the world, to come down to London, or to come up to London, whichever one it is, during peak times, to attend something like London Book Fair, is excessively expensive. It's going to be at least over £100. And with a lot of black writers, if they're, you know, they're either working part-time or not working at all, that's a lot of money. So in terms of the project that People Tree Press, we would pay for that. Because my thing was, you need to understand the industry that you're working in, um, or that they're, they're working in. So when they go to the London Book Fair, they can see exactly what is going on, the various different stages of publishing, and why sometimes when they feel their book should be selected, why it isn't. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and distribution, what Africa World Press did was kind of look at the market and think, OK, let's see how we can get our books out there into the market so that our publishers are vis so sorry, so that our writers are visible. Um, and they did a very good job at that. They did such a good job of that that major publishers kind of moved in on them and um, snuck in and, uh, and, 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 and and kind of moved in on that. And why, and why they kind of lost out a little bit afterwards was the very fact that they did find their, their distribution and, and work that is because for, for some reason, and this comes to back to the question of, okay, of the decolonization, is that for some reason, we, a lot of Africans, I will, I, won't, I will try not to be too general, a lot of Africans still kind of think that if it's coming from a white business, they're not going to get ripped off. But if they go to a black business, they will. And that's something we've really got to get past. And so, for example, you know, a, so for example, a, white, um, um, uh, a writer might think, well, OK, if I publish with X publisher that I know that's very well known out there, everything's going to be fine. Whereas if I go with AWP, AWP, it might not be. So, you know, we've really kind of 
really got to trust ourselves and trust our own, our own businesses a bit more. So that's my own timer there. <laughs> so I'm just kind of rushing through this too, so we can leave things for discussion. But the other thing that AWP did as well, they did distribute for other black publishers. And that's what I just kind of highlighted here. For Third World Press, which are based in Chicago. For Black Classic Press, which are based in, uh, which are based in Maryland. Not Maryland, yes, they're, no, in, they're based in Baltimore. Um, and, they, and for Karnak, who are, who are based here. Um, I wanted to discuss the African Poetry Book Fund just for, for a minute, even though it's a funded project and none of the others are, because they're doing something very, very different. The African Poetry Book Fund are trying to promote and, and encourage more poetry writing and publishing. And the way they did this to start off with, which is important, is the very fact that we were always saying with people who work with writers, to be a good writer, you need to be a good reader. So they've set up five libraries in Anglophone countries, and one of them is, is in the Gambia. Um, and there will be a symposium about the African Book Fund at Oxford University in October, but they just didn't have all the details yet. So these are five elements of APBF libraries. They have competitions to encourage writers at each stage of their career, from people who haven't written very much, who might have just written a few poems, to people who have a few more, to people who have enough for a chapbook. Because chapbooks, even though chapbooks before were kind of thought of, of oh, well, you know, they're just um, there for people who maybe are not that great in terms of their writing career. They're seen now as a very valid and very important stage. And there will be chapbooks, there will be competitions just around, around chapbooks. Writing your own collection as monographs and anthologies. I'm kind of known as an anthologist, and I think anthologies are very important, not only in terms of allowing writers who haven't written very much, or maybe have just written one good poem, to be alongside their literary hero in a book. But also, it tells a lot around the social context of the time. I think anthologies do. So APBF have been doing a lot of that work through, throughout a Africa. At the moment, only with Anglophone countries, but I, I believe they're trying to expand on that. Um, yeah, sorry, those are the, where the libraries are, in Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, the Gambia, and Uganda. That's a photo of, our, of the library in the Gambia when we were just putting it together. So there's Kinsey Abdullah. She's also a publisher in the UK. She publishes Scarf Magazine. Um, she's um, it's published in English, but she's Somalian, and she wants to do some more work in Somalia as well. And that's one of our young volunteers, uh, young volunteers there. So Kinsey came on holiday to the Gambia, and I said, this is going to be a wonderful, everything in Gambia is a Gambia experience, right? A wonderful Gambia experience for you. Come to the library and help us set it up. So that's what she did as part of her holiday. Um, so this was just another picture as well. So these are just, to wrap this all up very quickly, these are just some of the links. So if anybody wanted any of these links, I'm quite happy to send them out. Um, and I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you. OK, so now we'll move straight to Janet Remington from Routledge. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Can you hear me OK? Right, um, how's everyone doing? Just to pick up on um, Nan Nanjala's cue earlier. Are you also with us? <laughs> and it's oh, in the response. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the end, it's heading towards the end of a long day. So, um, yes, I'm going to wear my, my publisher's hat or put on my publisher's shoes and um, going to shift the discussion a little bit more towards the academic environment and, no, and no knowledge production from Africa. And um, just to uh, briefly mention again, um, so I've been working for about 10 years on, uh, on the African Journals program at, at Routledge, Taylor and Francis, and this covers all subject areas both multidisciplinary African studies, largely based on social sciences and humanities, but also moving out beyond that, um, maths, zoology, right through to music, linguistics, and um, biological sciences, etc. So 
we work largely in partnership with co-publishers, uh, mostly from South Africa, but also Eastern Africa, in particular Kenya, and also with Kadesria in, in Dakar. So um, I'm going to touch on, on two broad areas around opening up conversation around knowledge production from Africa. We all know there's much written about Africa. And then also to touch on access to um, access, research access to, to Africa. And so I'm just going to start off with some context around the global knowledge economy and Africa's place therein. And then if there's time to pick up on some findings of some recent analysis that we've done on our co-publishing arrangements um, in, in South Africa and beyond. So I just thought it it's, uh, might be a good starting point to start off with this um, stark reminder of the uh, significant size of Africa, which has been uh, reduced and diminished through what we've become familiar with the Mercator projection of the world um, that was devised in, in, in the colonial era. And uh, so, yeah, it's uh, just a, a good place to begin as we start to talk more about knowledge production. And maybe we should be switching things around and uh, doing things more like this. And this is a, a map of a different kind. It is out of date. It takes us back some 17 years, and it is only one slice looking at science, um, a particular subset of science publications. Um, so it's not truly representative, but it, it does point towards the um, dominance of northern research that has become uh, part of our landscape. But things have moved on a bit since then. So just to, turning to some charts. So here we see uh, the overall trend of growth across all regions of the world in terms of academic scholarship. And some regions are growing faster than others. And Asia is coming up very fast. Um, and you'll see this in the next slide in particular. Uh, we, we're going to mention, mention China again. So you see that uh, exponential growth there and, and the relative decline of, the, of American research output as a percentage of, the, of, the, of global output. So turning now to the continent. So growth, clearly, over, over some 16 years. And South Africa is there represented as a subset um, because it is the largest producer um, of uh, research outputs, at least as is represented by the, um, by the Web of Science um, measures. And the African research has grown by a third in this period. Sorry, by, by, yeah, by, by around 30% in this period. Okay, and then a breakdown by kind of the top 10 countries. <coughs> Just briefly for, for some information. And so up until this point, I've um, been talking largely in a quite generalized terms around uh, the whole range of subject areas. And I just got the next slide. Um, the next slide just looks at one particular study that was done in, uh, that was published in, in, African, study, in African Affairs, which um, has, is, is often talked about as the top African studies journal, the, the Journal of the Royal African Society, um, at least top in, in terms of the impact factor and recognition uh, in, um, in many institutions. So here there's a bit more of a sobering picture, at least as far as two journals are concerned in terms of African representation of authors. So this, is, this study showed that 
um, the, the proportion of African authors between 1993 uh, and 2013 decreased. But um, this is not the whole picture, of course. Other things are also going on. So just, if I've got time, Stephanie, mm -hmm. just to reflect on a few findings that we've, um, we've just looked at quite recently from our African Journals program. And then we'll touch on again about, um, around access issues. So just a snapshot of the program that uh, I've been working on for the past years and a number of access and authorship schemes and initiatives. I think we'll pick up on some of this in the question time and in relation to, I think, Helen's presentation. So this um, slide is really looking at, at authorship, at papers published over time within our African portfolio. And we've seen growth across, um, uh, or growth of African authors from the whole range of countries on the continent as a subset, South Africa, and then rest of world, all, all increasing. And usage from those three uh, broad categories too. So um, there's uptake and interaction with the content from countries beyond Africa as well as on the continent. And then in terms of citations, there's a comparison of, um, of, of citations as measured once again within the, um, the web of science analytic universe um, of um, between 2012 and 2016 across a range of, of regions and countries. So um, overall an increase in citations of journals in this portfolio with a huge increase from South Africa but also from elsewhere. But we, we're, not in, we're not seeing um, other ca African countries being represented here. Um, also, just lastly, um, the altmetric, uh, um, some, some altmetric outputs. Um, so the research from this portfolio is being picked up in, in blogs, uh, through social media, being referenced in, in Wikipedia, and also finding its way to some extent into the policy arena. So I think fairly encouraging, but obviously some room to go and a brief look at the geography of the altmetric attention. Uh, fairly widespread coverage, obviously some, ga some gaps in Francophone Africa, Central Asia, some parts of South America. So, um, yes, so this brings us, yeah, so I think there's, there's quite, quite a few things to think about. Um, the, the underrepresented nature still of, of African scholarship and knowledge production, but some increases and some, some really encouraging aspects. And I think the whole area of, of social media and engagement beyond the academy is an area that's really growing. Now we'll move straight to Helen Porter from the Sowers Repository. Hi there, so I'm um, Helen Porter. I work in the library and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to tell you um, about what we do to support um, open access to um, SOAS research outputs um, produced by SOAS academics. Um, so this is just a screenshot of the content of SOAS Research Online. So SOAS Research Online was set up about 10 years ago. Um, it's hosted at the University of London Computing Centre. Um, and we maintain the content at SOAS. Um, and as such, the idea is that we, we keep a record of, of every output produced by SOAS academics. But wherever possible, um, we're trying to obviously populate that with full text that will be, be available immediately for researchers around the world, 
or eventually after um, embargoes have expired. So this is just a screenshot of the um, uh, Department of Africa, um, Languages and Cultures of Africa. Um, and all of these items, when they're um, added to the SOAS Research Online Repository, um, they are automatically um, pushed through to the SOAS Library Twitter feed, um, through Facebook, so we try and promote our research that way. Um, the uh, contents of SOAS Research Online are all indexed in Google and in Google Scholar profile. Um, so we're trying to, if somebody searches through Google Scholar, they have an option to access an open access text if somebody can't get access through journals. Um, just to give you some of the stats um, of SOAS Research Online. So since it was started, we've got 17,000 um, items um, in SOAS Research Online. Um, and as you can see, about 20% of those are full text. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit about what's happening in the UK with regard to policies on open access, um, because as you'll see, that, that's made a significant difference for us um, in um, making our research available. Um, but um, as you can see, all of our research has been downloaded about two million times overall since um, SOAS Research Online was started. Um, and just to point out here are our top um, most down downloaded items. Um, and if you look at the right um, um, over there on the screen, um, that's a record of a PhD thesis, um, which is our most downloaded PhD thesis. Um, which is the norms of Swahili translations in Tanzania. Um, so over 11,000 downloads. Um, and our database allows us to see where the downloads um, are made. And as you can see, this, this thesis was downloaded the most in Tanzania. Um, when we look at the downloads overall, I think it's the same as what Janet said about this sort of disparity within Africa about where items are downloaded. So we can see in some countries, uh, material's been able to be downloaded a, a lot, but in others, not so much. Um, and also um, another positive development that we're doing um, this year and next year that should be available is our back run of PhD theses um, at SOAS will all be available um, on open access in SOAS Research Online. So that's about 2,000 PhD theses. So there'll be a lot of um, studies on Africa um, made available then as well. Um, they're being digitized um, by ProQuest, um, but will be freely available via SOAS Research Online as well. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I'm sorry, the slides, it's, it's, it's um, tripped off in the formatting there, but um, I just wanted to highlight that one of the most significant drivers for open access to research information in the UK has been the introduction of a policy um, from Hefke um, in April 2016. Um, there was a requirement that all um, researchers employed at UK institutions have to make their journal articles available in what we call these institutional repositories. Um, otherwise, that research can't be submitted to our research assessment exercises that happen every seven years. Um, and that's had a significant impact on, on the amount of full text that's been made available. So as you can see, um, in 2014 to 2015, um, from April to April, we had 41% full text. And that increased, sorry, it's gone off, but uh, 2016 to 2017, um, there's now 94% of journal articles um, added to SOAS Research Online that can be made um, available. Um, so that's really been a positive um, driver for SOAS. Um, because before, before that, although um, researchers were wanting to make material open um, access, it hadn't happened in that kind of consistent way. Um, but obviously, from my perspective, it, I think in the UK that this idea of making research available, open, uh, available openly has, has sort of transformed a little bit into a compliance issue. And so we're not able maybe to sell the positives quite as much as we should about making research um, openly available. Um, there's also very um, quite strict requirements for researchers with funding from our um, grant agency. So the Research Councils UK and the Welcome all have um, quite strict rules on making particularly journal articles available open access as well. And that can either be through um, a repository like SOAS Research Online, but also funders do give money for um, paid open access to journals to make, to make that available as well. Um, so I think um, for a while, um, what we saw was um, about these figures of about 20%, 10% full text in these repositories. Um, and there was a feeling, I think, that open access was a good thing to do, but it wasn't, I didn't see as much evidence of it growing in, in these kind of institutional support frameworks. But I think that that's definitely um, changing now. 
Um, so what I've just shown on there is I think that there are um, repositories across Africa that use the same software as soft, SOAS Research Online does. Um, so there's a growing number of repositories to support open access. Um, and also there's um, initiatives like Cielo, which is a, a South American um, repository for the whole of, of South America. So there's definitely growth in that area. Um, this search engine here, Core, um, it, you can search all open access content across the world. And as you can see, there's 77 million open access articles that you can find within that database. So there's definitely you know, a lot of um, academic research being made available. Um, and I've just sorry, done some very crude searches um, just by country to show the amount of material that is available um, in that database. Um, on the right, you can see there's lots of innovation now happening um, around open access. So lots of software companies are thinking creatively about what they can do. So this open access um, button is something um, that you can search. And if you have the identifier or the URL for a particular article, you just enter it in. It's called a DOI into the search engine, and it will find any open access text. Um, available online, so it means that you don't have to pay for that. Um, and I think that they're thinking that this service could be used in, in services such as um, exchange of information between libraries, so interlibrary loans, so that um, we could exchange open access information more easily when, when researchers need it or members of the public. So, um, so this is a really good development. Um, so I've put in some challenges of, of what I see about um, from my perspective as, of working with and supporting open access at a UK um, university is on the top left is a diagram that was done. Um, I'll, I can put the link in the slide. Um, it basically maps out the different policies that all intersect with open access. So what we have is there's different publisher policies, um, agreements on open access, different funders have different policies. And so when you're working to support that, that can be a challenge and for researchers of knowing what the rules are in making material open access. So it isn't always the most intuitive, easy thing to do. Um, especially when researchers are very engaged with services like academia.edu and ResearchGate, I think, which are fantastic for making research um, available and networking. But also, we've seen that these services are being bought or are owned by commercial um, companies and have private investment. And it, I think academia.edu is increasingly um, becoming a little bit more closed, so you need a login to be able to get the information. And that isn't really, truly, I don't think, the spirit of open access. So. Um, we're watching those developments quite carefully. Um, on the top there, I've put there's a Beale's list of predatory journals and publishers, because I think I've read some articles that have suggested that um, these predatory journals um, um, are taking advantage of funder money in order to um, offer publishing without proper peer review, et cetera, et cetera. So um, these lists of, of publishing, um, that will help us to kind of um, that academics don't publish in those journals, um, but that's a, a, a thing that has developed, a market for these kind of journal publishing. Um, and also just that um, the publishers um, have been very good at um, allowing researchers to make a version of their article available on open access, but there's still quite long restrictions on when that can happen. So for a lot of research that, research that might be quite current, it might not be, uh, you might not be able to get access to it openly for a couple of years after publication. So that's something I think is, is still in shift, but we still see quite long embargo periods placed on, on articles for open access. Um, and then just this is a, just a, a screenshot of a database I use to check journal policies. And um, at SOAS, we have quite um, a lot of diverse scholarship and a lot of people that publish in quite small journals, and they might be um, in parts of the world that haven't developed open access policies in the same way as big publishers have. Um, and um, so it's not clear sometimes um, to us if, if we can make a version of an article open access. And with the new ref rules, I think there's been lots of discussion about where um, researchers should publish. And, and I think that the, all these policies, although they've been very good at increasing open access, they're also changing the way um, academics approach publication. <coughs> Um, because if they're required to make something open access, in some senses, they might be ruling out supporting smaller, smaller journals, and that could be something um, that can be quite detrimental to um, 
countries that haven't got these um, um, policies in place yet. Um, but there are some <coughs> new models of open access that I think um, are meeting some of the challenges that we're facing. So o Open Library of Humanities is based at Birkbeck. Um, and what they've done is they've taken a model where um, libraries um, um, go into partnership with them. Um, and SOAS is a member of Open Library of Humanities. And what it allows is for them to su sustain a platform where journals, um, our academics can submit um, journals um, for free and readers can read them for free. Um, so there isn't these APC charges. Um, so that's the Open Library of Humanities. Um, they're also transferring, some journals are transferring over to them. So Glossa used to be called Lingua and it was published by Elsevier and the editorial board decided to move over to the platform Open Library of Humanities to kind of support this model of open access where authors are not required to pay to, um, to write. Um, yeah, because I think that is also a, a concern. Um, equally, funders in the UK now are recognising that if they have got these policies where they want research to be made openly available, they also need to provide some infrastructure to do that. So the Wellcome have just designed a new platform where researchers that are funded by Wellcome can deposit any research. So that could be data, articles, etc. Um, and they maintain that and they maintain the cost of that. So I think that's another positive development. Um, I think um, the UK policies that I mentioned before about journal articles, it seems that this is going to be something that very much is still um, pushed for in the UK. Um, there's been some indication that Hefke, um, who managed the research assessment in the UK, possibly will ask for books to be made open access for the next research assessment. And Hefke as well have, along with other research councils, have also written policies and frameworks now um, that might require um, researchers to share their research data or do require researchers in some circumstances to share their research data. Um, and that's something at SOAS, which is um, something we want to develop and support, but is a challenge for social sciences and humanities um, more than it is for the sciences because there are quite um, strong ethical implications of that as well. So that's something that, that we're, we're developing support for. Um, over there, I've just put that JISC are developing a shared UK national um, uh, infrastructure where researchers and institutions can deposit data. And I think that's a really positive thing to do um, because previously we all had um, separate institutional repositories um, for universities, but a national repository, it does make um, the service a lot more robust. So I'm really looking forward to that if it, if it comes out. Um, and again, um, the Royal Society have issued a statement on open peer review, so making the process of peer review more transparent. So that's how um, things are changing in the UK. And I think the UK is very much seen as a leader in, um, in these developments towards open access or open research. But I'd be very um, interested to hear your views on, on whether that's something that is, is a challenge um, for other parts of the world. So thank you. Okay, I've been told we can go on until quarter to six. I just wanted to thank, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, uh, I wanted to thank everybody actually for such high quality and interesting presentations uh, on a range of topics. And once I open up to you for questions, perhaps we can take a couple at a time. Um, the lady here and purple. Just, just, just wait for the mic if you wouldn't mind. Uh, yeah. Um, question. Um, Khadija, I see you're doing a lot of work in Gambia, and um, I wanted to know if you're aware of Calabash in Jamaica? Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> and I want to know if you are doing any links there. I mean, I'm from the Caribbean, I'm Jamaican, and um, I'm into Pan-Africanism, and I'd like to see the Caribbean linking with Africa more. And um, I go to Calabash every, every other year that it's on. And it's such a beautiful thing held in um, St. Elizabeth um, yeah, yeah. in Jamaica, where um, it's not talked about, but it's, you, we have all the best writers that come there, mainly from America. But I would like to see more African writers. Um, Speak to Kwame. 
okay. I will. I will. Um, <laughs> or, you know, um, yes, that would be good. But I don't know how, how, what influence uh, you have that you could speak to Kwame. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Cam, thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the audience? Answer all the questions. The, the lady at the back in the red. Thank you. Thank you for some very, um, really exciting presentations. I especially enjoyed yours, um, Hadeja. My name is Mary Anderson, and I've been involved in pub educational publishing. And I'm really interested to know whether you or anyone else, or whether you're aware of any um, developments in um, educational publishing, not in the research sense, but actually for primary schools in, uh, in African languages. Thank you. OK, thank you. And the, the, the woman sitting next to you. Hi, maybe just to follow up on that, um, not so much in academia, but educational publishing, and you were kind of touched upon um, fiction coming out of, I think you said, Kenya. Do you see a value in what's currently developing with um, audiobooks, for example, especially in light of um, enabling stories to be told in different languages? And also, given the particular oral history, or the, the history of, um, oral literature in Africa. Do you see that developing in the future? Thank you. Okay, I think that's probably enough for Khadija. To, Could I just to... add something oh. else there? There's been no mention of African Storybook, which is one of the big platforms for um, publishing you know, stories for children in African languages. Is that the one in South Africa? Um, it's, it's, a comb it's with, um, I can't remember the, the acronym, but it, yes, it's South Africa so. and the University of Van um, British Columbia, Vancouver. Okay, can we just take the question down here? Is this really leading rather than uh, trying to foster the development of... Uh, sorry, my face is in the microphone. Sorry. Uh, recently, I've been involved in fostering development of writing of stories for a primary school program, but also extra to the school uh, for children. And I struck the problem that teachers, head teachers, national trainers of teachers didn't have any concept in their own language of writing children's stories which were amusing, uh, like English children's stories, taking magic carpets to places or animals being personified. And I think it was Rebecca's talk this morning made me wonder if maybe I was beating the wrong drum, that uh, the kind of stories that people tell in Africa would be the appropriate thing for children in Africa and not what I thought was appropriate for them. But, but let me just add that I was a bit concerned that the stories were mainly about daddy beating mommy because she gave him maize for dinner instead of meat. And maybe none of you would think that was appropriate. It's just a question. I'm just at the beginning of this, at the very micro level. Khadija, do you want to speak to, yeah, do you speak first? Um, yeah, Anjala, I'll try and keep it. Uh, yeah, I'm aware of Calabash um, Festival um, and the magazine. In fact, when I did my first festival in Gambia 2007, I actually copied their format, having that long weekend, because you can go to Gambia for a long weekend. So it actually, it actually worked. Um, it's interesting, because Kwame is the associate editor for, for poetry at People Tree, and I and I also work with People Tree, and I know and Calabash has changed format a bit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, now it's every other year there have been changes, but it's very much up to who they want to program, etc. You know, um, and there's like so many writers even at People Tree, but he hasn't necessarily invited a lot of people from there. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. It's hard to do a festival and keep costs low, et cetera, and I mean, there's a lot of things involved. Sorry, I'm just trying to say, saying et cetera a lot because there's, I know we haven't got a lot of time, but we can talk about it afterwards. The interesting thing about what's going on in the Gambia, and it goes back to what somebody was speaking about, this lady about diaspora. We don't, in Gambia, they're not called the diasporans, and we've got a group called the African Homecomers Collective. So no matter where you're from outside of Gambia, you're, you're a homecomer. You're not a diasporan, you're a homecomer. And a lot of them are very involved in what's going on 
in Gambia and culture. A lot of them are very involved, for example, in the library. So part of one of our volunteer groups for the library are the African Homecomers Collective. We make sure, for example, if we're having poetry events, that there'll be some from the homecomers and there'll be Gambians as well. And that's what we're trying to continue, for example, with the festival in January. So we are trying. <laughs> but yeah, and I've got some slides I can give you about the festival. Um, in terms of um, children, educational books and children's books in, in African language, it, I mean, it, it's so different, obviously, from country to country, and it, and it depends on how and how wealthy those countries are as well. But I'm also a member of the African Literature Association. And we do know that a lot of the times, governments don't actually support writers who, who, who write books for children in African languages. You might be able to write them, but they're not gonna help you get them, distribute them through the schools, because they want to have the work uh, want the children to have the work in European languages. So that is also their, their challenge. I mean, there's also another challenge, a little bit in terms of not only the type of stories, but the illustrators. I mean, especially in terms of the children's books for African children that are printed outside of Africa, definitely at least, most of the illustrators are white, they're not black. That's also, to me, that is just as big an issue as the story itself. Um, so, you know, so there's, there's these different issues, but really, there are people who do want to write those books in home languages, and they do happen, but it's, it just depends on what the publishing is like in those countries, and sometimes it's very difficult. And then we end up, as I mean, some of you know, work in the education area, is that at the end of the day, they just get photocopied. Sometimes the writers don't mind. Um, I wrote with one writer, Tijan Sala, and um, one of the, the bookshop the book in Gambia said, well, look, the kids are using this poem in schools, but they can't get it. And he said, just photocopy it. I don't mind. If they're using it in schools, let them photocopy it. So that was in English. It's not known language. But those are different things that people are trying to do because they, a lot of writers on the ground, who, whether they're writing in English or home language, do realize that the local languages do need to be in the schools. But sometimes it's not the writers with the issues with, it's with the government. That's mm -hmm. is. Nanjala is going to say something more on that, on the Kenya context. I think, which well, would be great. Um, not, not even specifically the Kenyan context. I think it just goes back to the slide that Janet put up about how big Africa is. Um, because a lot of the things, I, I, I personally used to believe very much in this myth that people aren't publishing in African languages. And then you realize Swahili is an African language. Mm -hmm. And people in Tanzania are publishing many, many. I have a copy of The Little Prince in Kiswahili. They publish in children's books in Swahili. It's a massive industry. But another country that people always ignore is Somalia. And Somalia has an extremely robust publishing industry. They publish academic journals in the Somali language. I went to the Hargeisa International Book Fair last year, no, year before last, and they, I would say probably 80% of the titles that were available were all in the Somali language. And it was packed. It was absolutely jam-packed with people. It is the single largest social event in the Hargeisa's uh, calendar. Oh, and people are literally building their whole year around being in Hargeisa for the book fair. Um, Mogadishu has a book fair. Garoe has a book fair. Um, and the, an 11-year-old boy, I think, won a, a publishing prize in the first Mogadishu book fair for his children's book in Somali, um, which is targeting other young people. I think when we think about publishing, and this goes back, I think, to a point that may, perhaps I think Stephanie's the one who made this point in the beginning, that what we think counts as publishing is also part of the problem. And what we think counts as a publishing industry is part of the problem. So people in Somalia are not publishing their academic journals through the formal journal system. They're distributing them at the universities that they're, um, I think, in outside my hotel in Hargeisa, I think I counted six different universities and they're distributing these uh, publications within those university networks, and they're doing research and all of this stuff because Somaliland is very much outside the formal um, systems and structures that are out there. So what we think about when we think about what is publishing, what counts as publishing, what is an African language, or what counts as an African language, I think is also part of the understanding issues that we, we have. Um, and to add to that, I'm also very surprised by this idea about there not being children's stories. I grew up on children's stories in Swahili. Kaka Sungura and um, Mze, um, what's his name? Like, I, there's a whole pantheon of publishing of children's books in Swahili. Children, we, we study literature in Swahili in school, mandatory, all, the, all through the 12 years. 
Again, what's different is how this information is consumed. And part of the challenge that we have is that, in Kenya at least, um, writing in Swahili and publishing in Swahili does not have the prestige factor that publishing in English has. And so if I leave my office and walk downtown to River Road and you know downtown area, I'll find things that are printed in a printer, photocopied, stapled, distributed, sold for 50 shillings in Swahili. But I'm not gonna get that in a bookshop. I'm not going to get that in, you know, like for, in a, at a book fair, right? And so then there's this whole thing, well, Kenyans don't read and Kenyans don't publish books. But there is a large market for these things. It just does not exist in the structures, at least in Kenya. And maybe this is a dis dis difference between um, the countries that I know, the literatures that I know well, Kenya, Tanzania, Somalia, and perhaps other parts of Africa, and, and Ethiopia, Amharic. Ethiopia is another interesting case because they have so much literature published in a language that isn't spoken anywhere else. And that's a policy that is in place, a state policy that is in place. You can get uh, publishing in Amharic, you get publishing in Oromia, you get publishing in all of these languages that isn't legible anywhere else. And then we say, well, Ethiopians don't read or don't publish, but they do. They're just not publishing for us. <laughs> Great, Sorry, that's back. brilliant. Can we take, <laughs> can I take the, the guy at the back who had his hand up? Yeah, no? Oh, sorry. He was just doing a black hat. Okay, brilliant. Um, and then the lady at the front, please. And then Frederica. So the person at the front with the blue hat. I think it was you, ma'am. I think it was her. Sorry. Uh, it's her, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I did that. No worries. Uh, that I would like to... Sorry. I... I cannot remember your name because I was looking the program, but I cannot remember your name. Yeah. Khadija. Khadija. Mm. Sorry? Khadija. Khadija. I'm not, I'm not going to I'm not going to Sorry. Yeah, I just kind of snuck in today. <laughs> so about the African books in the Caribbean, I would like to add that it also could be good uh, in the rest of Latin America because in Latin America is a lot of African influence. Yeah also from Spain too, so this, has this, growing. these relations could be stronger, could be yeah. good if they are stronger. If I can just, I'll respond to that really quickly. Yeah, we noticed like in, when I was at the last conference, the African Literature Association a couple of years ago, we had people, for example, come over from Brazil saying, wanted to find out more about what we were doing and telling us what they were doing. And there was a great exchange. And I know, for example, Africa World Press, they now started doing their, their um, book stands in conferences focused on uh, Latin American literature. And they said they had a, an amazing response. So then we realized that there needs to be more connections there, mm -hmm. definitely. Any other final questions? Okay. I had just a comment. In the morning session, Amiru Sunny mentioned a Jami writing, and there's a flourishing publishing industry that is widely overlooked. And it's completely downplayed in, in the Western academic literature where it's always kind of swept aside as, oh yeah, there's a little bit of uh, religious literature left over, but it's not true. There's a flourishing uh, publishing industry um, of all across the zone of influence of Islam. Um, and then um, Lutz mentioned the market uh, literature in Hausa. That's also a huge in formally not recognized uh, publishing press in Nigeria, in Cameroon, in both in Boko and in Ajami in, in, in major languages. So I think we really need to <laughs> widen our horizon a little bit when we talk about publishing and for whom. Thank you. Are there any final questions or comments? Step at the back. Uh, I come from Ethiopia and I just want to compliment what the speaker has uh, said earlier. Uh, I'm Hurricane Afano Roman, two of the biggest languages in, in Ethiopia. There's a lot of knowledge production, both focusing on you know, primary education, children, media. Uh, but the sad thing is, I mean, most of almost all the universities, um, Ethiopia has, uh, has been investing a lot of money in higher institutions in the past decade and a half. And uh, we used to have two universities 20 years back. Now we, we have around 40. And all of them are using English. So, there is a missing link between people have, I mean, people learn, uh, you know, science, uh, you know, geography and history, 
in their own mother tongue, which is Amharic and Afanoromo. These are the two biggest languages in Ethiopia. But as they progress to you know, high school and when they join the university, the language of knowledge production will change. It mostly, I mean, it's pushed by the availability of more sophisticated, uh, I mean, most, most of this production is mostly focusing on you know, elementary uh, education. There are some attempts to produce scientific journals uh, in these two languages, but it's not that, uh, that strong. I just want to highlight that. Thanks. Thank you very much. The, can we have the final point from Amadou at the front, if that's OK? Um, other visitor. Well, I just want to say that this idea of publishing, you know, there is what we call the market editions of certain works, usually done by individual authors, whose uh, sort of disciples will now get the, tri the transcript or the whatever, and then publish for their own consumption. That is one. So that is an area. Secondly, this bill's uh, list of predatory journal or publication. I think it's a very serious problem in the sense that you cannot exhaust the list. If the thing keeps on growing and growing that you cannot actually catch up with it. So I think it's more or less of a cash and carry kind of thing that people find as very easy to publish quickly. You pay on Saturday, you get it published on Monday. And I think there's a sort of a program or mechanism put in place to guide, because that's created a lot of problems in some African universities now. People can start about 10 publications within the year, and then you can say, well, I published this much and uh, you know, this many, and so I deserve to be promoted. So are there no mechanism to be put in place? One, to assist universities, maybe through interlibrary something, to let them know what's actually there and what is not there, and secondly, to guide academics, young and old, in this regard. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Can we have Nandalo and then any final points from the panelists? And then we'll thank you and round up. Um, I really just wanted to restate the, and to underscore the point that I made about Somalia because I think Somalia and Somaliland is, are a great example of what is possible outside the traditional constraints of publishing and what is considered um, good publishing. And especially because um, I think that one of the biggest gaps in academic publishing is the gap between what African researchers think is worth researching and what the journals think is worth publishing. And I can give the example of myself. I published my first academic article um, probably about eight years ago, um, just straight uh, out of undergrad. And um, I couldn't get anything else published after that. And I kept wondering what was happening. I'm doing exactly the same kind of research. And one of my professors when I was in grad school said to me, well, you know, this isn't really that, um, what is it called? There's a phrase that, that they use um, that it wasn't, basically it wasn't interesting. And this research that I've been doing with social media, I've had a kind of a similar response because it's not about war, it's not about starvation, it's not about poverty, it's not about AIDS. So then how is it African? I've had those responses and I'm really grateful to be working with people who are actually thinking outside those limitations and saying, let's think about these things differently. But, um, when I went to Somalia, the thing that I, the, the first university that I visited, they were doing research on the Somali, um, they, there's a navigation system in Somalia that, because Somalia is a, seafar is a seafaring nation, there's a navigation system that's based entirely on the stars. And these three young men had been doing this research for almost a year for their master's thesis on collecting elders' knowledge on how to navigate the, the Indian Ocean using the stars. And they had produced, uh, they've produced a, a document about it, they've produced a calendar, they've recreated the Somali calendar, which predates the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar. And they've done all of this with no support outside Somalia. And no one outside Somalia is going to read it, right? So there's this, there's this idea of we as African researchers, we want to produce more, we want to write more, we want to get published more. But there's a gatekeeper system that makes it very difficult for us because I don't want to sh change my idea of what is interesting in order to be accepted. I don't want to change my interests in order to gain acceptance into the academy. There has to be room in the academy for people who have ideas that aren't necessar don't necessarily conform to the, you know, the dominant narratives. And that's, yeah, that's great. Helen, did you want to come back on anything, particularly the points about predatory publishing or any other point? Yeah, I mean, I think I didn't maybe mention that it, in the same way we talk about open access, that there's a lot of informal sharing of information that goes on in networks that kind of 
isn't really a, a, uh, accounted for. And also the, the kind of models that you're describing that are happening in Africa. I mean, in some ways you can see them emerging more in what's called the mainstream, the idea of academic self-publishing, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of trying to maybe look at alternative ways of, of getting information out there that isn't so tied in, I suppose, with the with the traditional kind of peer review model. So that was that was really interesting to me. And with regards to the predatory journals, sorry, so my understanding was that you wanted, you thought that there should be more guidance around that, yeah. Um, so I didn't put up that there are some um, websites available to kind of for researchers to make decisions about that, about whether or not a journal that pushes something out very quickly, it, it, if that's a good thing to do or, or not. So there, there is, although that's a list of journals, there is advice around around that as well. But I, but I agree, I think there's been some discussion about that list, about how do you classify what really is a predatory journal and what should be on there or not. So I think that was a good a good point. And anything final, very brief from Janet? Or yes, Katita? just to really, um, re, uh, to, to acknowledge what you're saying about the growing need to, to provide some support and guidance and tools for, for authors and researchers. Mm -hmm. It's an ever more complex landscape, and the rise of and these predatory or scam publishers, fake publishers, are yeah, they they're just they the numbers are staggering. The new outfits being created as we speak, and some they're getting cleverer and cleverer, and they they part you with your money before you even realise it. And now you know, and it also just raises the questions, the bigger questions around recognition within institutional environments that publication does count for so much. Mm -hmm. And, pub and um, there are studies to show that uh, re uh, researchers in institutions in Africa and elsewhere mostly end up paying for their own, from their own pockets. Mm -hmm. And some of them, you know, it, it's a few months salary just to, to, to yeah. pay for some, um, what, what end up being predatory journals, but it's their, their ticket to promotion. And um, within our, our portfolio, within um, our, uh, our office based in, in South Africa, we get so many requests from universities, from organizations, learned societies saying, please come along and do workshops and provide materials because there's so much confusion around this landscape and predatory publishers. So it's just acknowledging what you're saying. And it's particularly tough on the early career scholars. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, final word for Khadija. I'll be brief. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of um, add and kind of take from the Audrey Lord kind of quote, uh, poetry is not a luxury. For Africans, as far as I'm concerned, African publishing is not a luxury. It is, it is important for the sense that a lot of the African publishers, and when I'm talking African publishers again, I'm saying I'm talking publishers here, it's not just for profit, it's we're actually activists as well. And you're doing work in the community. And that is equally as important as the publishing which is being done. And we have to remember that. So even come, coming back to your point, it's like, you know, you don't want to have to change what you're writing to suit that market. That's what African publishers will do that because we have to, we need to. Um, John LaRose, who, who is the publisher for New Beacon, he had a dream to change the world. That's what he came to England to do, a dream to change the world. And that dream started from the basis of publishing to educate our community was starting with the publishing. And uh, that's why African publishers are so important. And that's a great Thank place you. to end this discussion. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I gather we...